delighted that you have found the Mindset Mentor Meets podcast. I'm Angela Cox, your host and indeed the Mindset Mentor, and I'll be interviewing executives and founders at the top of their game to find out what lies beneath. I want to know what makes people proud, how they define success, what holds them back and indeed what drives them forward. This is authentic and natural conversation with the best in the business. So listen in, enjoy and if you love what you hear, please do leave a review. And now over to today's guest. And welcome to today's podcast. Now, I am thrilled to say that I have got the lovely Juliet Maxim with me. I say with me, she's on Zoom, quite a few miles away from me, but she's here smiling down the screen. And Juliet, I've known her for about a year now, and she is the Media and Public Relations Manager for Greater Anglia. She's an expert in communications and has worked as a journalist in her former career. So she has so many stories to tell. Now, I've got Juliet here to talk about her proudest moments. I can't wait to hear what they are. Juliet, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you very much. Yes, I'm good. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me onto your podcast. I'm very honoured. Oh, you're very welcome. It's lovely to have you here. And I know you've just been saying to me that you've literally been back-to-back meetings all day, which is the story of, you know, many a leader's life. So I'm sure many can relate. You've not had much time to prepare, which of course I always like, because that means you're going to speak from the heart. Well, I'm sure you'll extract what you need from me, that's for sure. But <laughs> I, I've, had, I've given it a little bit of thought, but not done as much preparation as I would like to do normally. And isn't that always the way in terms of our busy lives? Yes. Well, I think working from home just seems to be an excuse for people to put in back-to-back meetings all over lunchtime. Maybe they're saying something that I need to lose a lot of weight or something and not actually have any food during my working day. I don't know. It is just the nature of this kind of working from home life, isn't it? Where the opportunity is to kind of stop and go and, you know, converse with people normally at work doesn't happen because everything has to happen by meeting. So the days just get crammed with Zooms, it seems like. They do, they do. And I'm tortured because I I work in my study and I have a beautiful view of lovely trees and grass. And it's such a beautiful day today, blue skies. And I'm just thinking, oh, this is what I miss walking to the office. Totally. I'm totally with you. And and I walk into work just for that reason, just to try and get a breath of fresh air because there's not many opportunities now. Now, I know that you're normally on the other side of the podcast because you've created a podcast for Greater Anglia. And so you're normally the one in the hot seat asking the questions. So how does it feel to be on the other side? It's a bit nerve wracking, to be (laughs) honest with you, because also, obviously, as a journalist, I'm used to asking questions. The only thing is, of course, I am also a media spokesperson. Ah. And in fact, (laughs) yesterday I was in London doing some media training with a few people from the business. So that media training hopefully should help me to give some good answers. <laughs> well, I hope so. around the question, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to let you do that. You should know me better than that by now. <laughs> and hopefully these questions won't be as pointed as perhaps some of the ones that you have to deal with from the media, because we're going to be talking about you and the things that you've achieved and the things that you feel proud of. So let's start with your first proudest moment, which might not be a moment it might be you know an achievement it might be a way of thinking but whatever that means for you hit me with it well do you know you asked for the three things I'm most proud of and I was talking to my three sons about this and (laughs) and of course it was the middle son who said oh that's easy that is one of them me (laughs) and then the other one said (laughs) well no and he said I'm not too sure about the other two (laughs) but that's uh that's sibling rivalry for you I could say, oh, all my wonderful three boys, because I am extremely proud of them and have a fantastic relationship with them. And I I think they're fine young men. But I'm going to be controversial, perhaps, and I'm not actually going to include those. (laughs) That's a given. Take it as a given. Yeah. 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 
I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is actually what I've done at Greater Anglia, which is where I work now. As you said, communications and PR manager. I'm really proud of the changes that I've brought to Greater Anglia, which I feel has been for the greater benefit of the company, but also of its customers. Mm. So I'm really, really proud of how I've changed PR and, and all the different things that I've introduced at Greater Anglia. I see that as a pretty big achievement. And it's nice to hear you talk about it in that way, because you know, I mean, I've worked in big organizations and often things like communications and PR can be the thing that's last on the list in terms of what's invested in or what might be deemed as important. And actually being able to come in and make a difference in that area takes a lot of oomph, a lot of resilience and a lot of taking people on the journey. So when you talk about being proud of the things that you've achieved, what are some of those things and, and how have you made that happen? Yes, and one of the things I've also needed is perseverance. It has to be said, <laughs> as I was talking to a colleague about what I was going to say, and she reminded me. So mm. w- when I started at Greater Anglia, PR was pretty old school. It mm-hmm. was really a case of a few press releases. And what they did had worked very well for a number of years. But, mm-hmm. you know, the world moves on. Communication certainly moves on. And it needed updating, bringing it into the 21st century. So that's precisely what I did. So I take a bit more of a strategic view to PR Mm. and a campaign view. So first of all, it was about looking at what the company needed to be talking about with customers and how we needed to be doing it. And so I put together a PR strategy and off that campaign plans and introduced a lot of new PR channels, communications channels. I am a former journalist. I love journalism. I love the news. But people get their news in different ways now, and they get their news about companies in different ways. So a company needs to produce its own news channels. And that's what I did at Greater Anglia. So we started using social media for PR. I set up, with the help of our marketing team, a really fantastic news desk section on our website where we published all of our news articles, Mm -hmm. started using video because, I mean, you only have to look for your social media channels. Everything is about video nowadays. And video is a very useful medium if you're sending out press releases because then journalists, much smaller teams, they can use your video either online or even we've even had our video used on TV and we've had audio from it used on the radio, which is just brilliant. and. We've just set up our podcast, Mm -hmm. which is really exciting. So all all sorts of new tactics is what we what we use now that I've introduced and all tied together with some really good campaign plans Mm -hmm. and an overall PR strategy. And also involved a lot of training. It was changing the way PR was done by the existing team. And well, they've really risen to it. They've relished the opportunity Mm -hmm. to do something new. And so, yeah, as a result, our reputation has increased. I would say that we get more out there with the media because we're giving them what they want. Mm. And it's just a lot of satisfaction for the people working in the company who see all of the stuff that we do on social media and respond to it and share it. And a great deal of satisfaction for the team who are producing it. So you can hear the passion definitely that sits behind it. So you've got this kind of setting of a vision and building a strategy and then having to take people on that journey by training them you know getting them to relearn how they've done things and and what they need to do differently you talk about embracing different ways of working that haven't been used before and that idea of your own perseverance to keep pushing people and and encouraging people along a path that they've not tread before One of the things that we've identified together is this ability you have to create the link between the business and its customers and translate the the language, if you like, or the way of operating into one that the customer can understand. And it's a real skill that you have that you just do naturally. And you're able to do that and it makes a difference. So tell me a little bit more about how you bring that in. 
I think for a start, it was very helpful that I was a commuter for 10 years myself. (laughs) (laughs) That helps because I know, you know, I, I know what matters to our customers because I was one of those customers myself. Yeah, you've worked the shoes. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's about never being sucked in to all of that corporate jargon, you know, never setting yourself up as a little bit different because you work for the railway and therefore the people that you're communicating to need to start using your language, always remembering that you need to use the language of the the people you're communicating to. I love that. That's almost like kind of ridding yourself of the ego, isn't it? Yeah, it's just keeping your feet on the ground, isn't it? And I look at the way other train operators communicate and I look at the way other travel companies do and other businesses. And I, you know, I I look at how I react to communication. Mm. And I think that's really important if you're going to be good at comms is partly you need a good instinct, but partly you need to look around the world that you live in. Mm. I always say to people, in the company when we're doing media training and when I'm just giving them a little bit of of a refresher before them doing an interview just imagine that you're talking to either your next door neighbor or a 10 year old but somebody who knows nothing about the railway and that's the way I do our comms and I like to use simple language you know why use a long word when a short one will do and use as few words as possible and that's how people react. And nowadays, in the world of social media especially, people can't be doing with reading mm. great big reams. And if you want communications to work, you need to be sure that people are going to be able to understand it. Yes. And that they don't need to look in a dictionary first yes. <laughs> before you know they understand what on earth you mean. And so those are the principles that mm. I operate by. And they're very important to me. And I am pretty rigid about making Mm. sure that other people use them and I think that my experience in journalism helps because if you read a newspaper story you know the paragraphs are short the sentences are short they don't use jargon it's all very simple and that's what all communication should Mm. be like in my opinion and you're right in terms of using that term all communication because those principles are transferable into every activity, every relationship, every communication that we have, if we come from that place of making our language and the way we communicate accessible for all, then that helps us to connect with other people. So I think, you know, we started off with the proud moment in terms of what you've done and how you've created this shift in the business, but actually what you've given us there is a principle that we can all take away and and use in our general conversation so like that so also about anticipating people's questions yeah because that's another thing that I'm tremendously proud of and that's all part of good communications at Greater Anglia is that I anticipate what it is that customers are going to ask and produce Q&A briefings which I share amongst all of the different departments that work at Greater Anglia or or I ask other people to do Q&As and so we're giving a good and a consistent response. Yeah, that to consistency. All customers, wherever they come in, whether it's on social media, whether they're ringing up the customer service centre, you know, anywhere, or whether it's someone on a station talking to a customer. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really important as well. And yeah. that's something actually, something so simple. Simple. But something that I think has actually, I know has made one of the mm. biggest impacts in my time at Greater Anglia because. I see the reaction from staff to the Q&As and then people ask me to produce more Q&As. Yeah, because it, it helps, doesn't it? And it helps people be able to have that dialogue and have the engagement with a customer without fear that they might be getting something wrong because you've got that consistent approach. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's about you and what you've created at work and the difference that you've been able to make with the team and the way things work. So what would be the next one? Well, the next one, I'm broadening it out. And I would say, do you know what? I am really proud of my career, full stop. As I said, you know, I've had three children. And as anyone who's lucky enough to have had children knows, and I know that not everybody is lucky enough to have children, they're bloody hard work, excuse my language. (laughs) And 
It's so true. It, they're just such hard work. But throughout that, I've also had a really interesting and varied career. I worked full time most of that time. Mm. I started off, you know, as a journalist and that was brilliant. I was like the first local journalist to go to Bosnia and was there oh, for a wow. week. And that was pretty scary, it has to be yeah. said. The war had just finished, but it didn't stop some strange man on a hillside pointing a gun at me, which was like oh, wow. a little bit alarming. I didn't ever feel terribly in danger until afterwards, but that was quite an experience. But also as a journalist, I got to interview celebrities. I had Margaret Thatcher slam a door in my face, you know, oh, no. which is uh, pretty exciting. I had uh, David Soul, if anyone remembers who he is, shouting down the phone at me. It turned out he was shouting at his dog, not at me. He was actually very nice indeed. People who don't know him, he's from Starsky and Hutch, the original. And then when I moved from journalism, I also had a little bit of time on the Nationals, which was a good experience. Mm. I then had such varied roles, all in communications. But, uh, you know, maybe one of the reasons I became journalist is nosiness. (laughs) Curiosity. Yes, curiosity. That's a better way of putting it. You're always much better with the words. (laughs) But you get to see behind the scenes in so many different places and yeah. see how things operate. And I think in the world of communications as well, because you have to understand what's happening, you get access you know, to the top people, to the directors, to the chief execs. And if you're good at the job, you get their confidence. Mm. And it, it just makes for a very satisfying mm. and interesting and exciting career that's my feeling anyway. Yeah. So it's never been, yeah, I have that Monday morning feeling sometimes when you think, oh, it's Monday. But I've always loved the jobs that mm. I've done. And I love my job full stop and my career. And, and I think how lucky is that, you know, because you need to work, don't you, if you want a nice roof over your head and, mm. and all the things that children want. <laughs> but to enjoy your job, I think, is one of the best things. And not everybody does, do they? So I'm and to love it, proud of that. to love it and to be able to have the passion that you have for it and know that that's OK when you've got children and, you know, three children, which is demanding. And I guess that's where my head is going to at the moment, because a lot of people are interested in this. How do you love your job and have big jobs that you've had and lots of responsibility at the same time as balancing that with being a great mum? And giving your children everything that they need. Because that's a, you know, it's a tough job for any woman. So how do you do that? I think you have to be organised, obviously. And they'd say, don't they, you know, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. (laughs) And the thing is, I've lived my life at sort of 100 miles an hour for so long now that actually I don't know what to do with myself if I don't have anything planned for an evening. It's Mm. just the idea of just sitting down and doing nothing for a whole evening. It's just, oh my God, what can I do? It's just, you know, it's alien. And I've obviously been very lucky to have the support of my husband who has picked up on a a lot of the child stuff. And also, do you know what? We're a crumpled household. So I haven't been ironing all (laughs) their clothes. Crumpled. Um, I love that word. They didn't have (laughs) baths every night when they were children, but they were clean and they had their hair washed. They didn't go to after school clubs every single night of the week. Mm. I did have all three of them doing football at weekends. That was a huge commitment. Yeah. But, you know, it's about not trying to be super mum the whole time, but knowing that just being a mum and giving them a secure upbringing and actually in my opinion being a good role model that's enough and I mean I've chosen to do a lot with my children I've been to every single parents evening every school play Mm. every sports day have to confess I was very pleased when sports days ended because I (laughs) hate sports (laughs) day immensely (laughs) but equally I didn't help them with their homework every night I kind of thought well you know (laughs) you can do your homework if you need help, I will help you, but I'm not going to sit down every night and do that. And do with it with you. you. It's about allowing them to also have some time when they just have to fill up their own time because, you know, I'm a busy person myself. But amazingly, two of my sons, the two who are now working, have actually followed my footsteps into the field mm-hmm. of work where I'm. So one of them is a social media editor for Lad Bible and after doing a journalism yeah. degree. And the other one is doing PR for Essex Climate Action Commission. 
he was doing a journalism degree, did a week's work experience with Greater Anglia, doing PR, and so uh. PR is the line for me. And that, no, I think that's great, isn't that's it? That's role modelling, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think, you know, they've seen the enjoyment mm. that I've got out of my career. I, I used to take them along with me on jobs when I was a journalist. And my oldest one actually came in and did work experience with me when he was about eight. And I was setting him off, right, because he was a very bright lad, setting him off writing press releases for the app for the paper. Yeah, it's a juggling act. But Mm. the thing is for me is I wanted children. I was tremendously lucky to be able to have them. And I have enjoyed every minute of having them, nearly every minute. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe not for trying to persuade them to put their shoes on and clearing up after them. But, you know, they're good company and they've always been good company. But and I'm I, hearing this idea of being a good enough mum is almost the definition of being a super mum. You don't have to be ticking all the boxes in all the different areas to be good enough. No, you don't. You don't. You just, you do what you can really. And, and I think <sighs> Love it's that. about, it's about, you know, giving them your attention and your love, that's mm. the crucial thing, and the security. So they've not had masses of money or anything like that. So they've not been showered with amazing gifts, mm. but they've had, you know, a mum who will take them out, take them camping, go and play football with them, you know. Oh, you're a better you mum than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I played football very well with them, though. <laughs> and they've been very, very, very fortunate to have both mm. parents, which, you know, not all... Yeah people have and that's just you know the the lucky boys in many respects I'm sure there might have been things they would have liked even more but you know I just think society can make parents feel tremendously guilty and you know all you can do is your best really and get that balance you know the version of you that loves her job can be a better parent because you've got that fulfillment and satisfaction and you're able to then show them that demonstrate that which is where that role modeling's come in so it's really nice to hear that you're totally spot on there totally spot on I couldn't agree more I mean I I know that I don't think I could have been a full-time mum because I mean I've been working since I was what I think I got my first job when I was about well 13 I got my first (laughs) job but the first job where I actually went out to walk rather than walking somebody's dog, I was 15 or 16. Yeah. So I feel almost, I know it's terrible, but almost defined by my job in a, to a certain extent. And I think I would have gone nuts if I'd been sitting at home with them, going to all mm. the different toddler dance, toddler singing group, baby swimming, you know, play dates. It, it wasn't for you. It wasn't for me, no. And I do admire people who can do that, but. But the outcome, you know, if we got a line of children who've all had these different upbringings in, in different ways, the outcome is generally they're probably all the same. But it's just the inputs to that for you need to be different to what they are for somebody else. Mm. But the fact that you own it and that you use this idea of being good enough, I think that's really healthy. And I think it's something that we can all, again, just attach to in terms of we don't have to be super you know, mm. and, and that's actually not what we're shooting for. But this idea that we can sit at the end of every day and go, I did my best. Yeah, exactly. Then that's good. Yeah. Just get to the end of the day sometimes. Yeah. Survive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's number two. What have we got for number three? Well, number three is a little bit different. And that's for, I don't know how long now, but it must be maybe 18 years I've been a school governor and I've been a school governor at the school where my children the primary school where my children were oh god and it's just such a special school it's in a community which is a real mixture of people so there is a, an element of social deprivation and there's some very middle class families as well it's in the town center it's near the main park in the town And it has this amazing head teacher who really cares about the children at the school and the people who work there. And it's been a complete privilege to be a governor there, to support him and Mm. to support that school and to actually give something back to the community. My boys have such fond memories of that school and of the head teacher, and it gave them the most excellent foundation in life. And so I feel really honoured to be giving something back to that school. And I've learned so much from it as well. You know, I've, I've attended all of the committees and, mm. you know, 
helped write the policies and review the policies. And in that time, there are some things that I've done at that school that I'm also really proud of. One of which was we've had a number of Ofsted inspections. And in the last one, we went from satisfactory to good with outstanding features. Oh, wow. That one, I kind of used my sort of media spokesperson element of my job and the media mm-hmm. training to train the governors in what to say. Ah, oh, the, the same thing inspector. you do. Yeah. Ah. But that's really important because everybody at schools are just so nervous when Ofsted mm. comes in. It's a big deal, obviously. Yeah. And it was really great to be able to support the school using some of the skills the from my job and and I've used that for, you know I've used them in other respects at the school to support the school when it's gone through various challenges and when I was a, a journalist I just did endless stories about the school so certainly gave the um the head teacher a good grounding in, in how <laughs> to use the media to his advantage it's so right that isn't it because I mean that principle that you know the big chiefs are coming in to see what we're doing wrong which can be the, you know, a real kind of triggering thing for many people who hold beliefs about must get stuff right. Here they come, they're coming to check up on us. And if we think about us, you know, as humans going into interviews and how many times do we come out of the interview and go, oh, mess that up. I didn't say this. I didn't say that. I didn't put myself forward in the best light. Actually, what you're helping them to do there with the media training is get the consistency across the board, you know, shout about what we're doing in the right way and get people ready for that inspection that's going to happen. And then as a result of that, they shine through the process and you get the good without standing as opposed to yeah, care. That, that's absolutely it. It's about helping them to shape the messaging yeah. that they're going to use, which is obviously that's a huge part of my job. And just getting them to think about what answers they can give, what the questions might be. It's a bit like the Q&As again. Yeah. What the questions might be and look at all of this information we've got and this is the information that we're going to use. Yes. And I should have said actually with the previous one that part of my job is being a media spokesperson as well and I've done some really tough interviews. I mean, I did one with Jeremy Vine where he was gunning for us, absolutely gunning for us. And at the end of it, I totally turned it around and he ended up by saying, oh, Greater Anglia, they seem like good eggs. Uh So I think being able to take those skills and Mm. use them in your community, you know, for the good of all the children at that school and, you know, and their parents and the teachers and the staff, that's really special. Mm. And that's why I am so proud of that role as a governor. It's making a difference. You're making yeah. a difference, aren't you? Outside of the working environment, but using the same skills yeah. to make a difference in the community. And you just reminded me of something there in terms of, you know, Ofsted inspectors or Jeremy Vine. That idea that you're in a situation with an opponent. And actually, how often do we go into communications in our relationships and, and look at the other person as being more powerful or you know, that the gunning for is the term that you just used. And then the idea, actually, if we can frame in our mind that idea from transactional analysis around I'm okay and you're okay, and we're both the same and we can meet in that kind of equal place, then that can often just take the fuse out of the situation. And what you do is build on that and actually give people the evidence as to why they can excel in this area. Yeah. So I really yeah. like that. I think that's it. And I think that's that also comes from being a journalist because when, yeah. when you're a journalist, you feel on an equal level with anybody. You know, yeah. you are prepared to ask questions of anybody, whether mm. it be, you know, the person at the top of an organisation or, you know, so-called at the bottom of the organisation. You don't feel overawed in yes. the situation. And that's probably helped with being a media spokesperson as well, to be honest. Yeah. But I guess, the you know, the flip side of that is that can become, well, I'm the powerful one. Mm. And we see that all the time in journalism, don't we, where, you know, a journalist will go on the attack. But what you're doing in these environments now that you work in is actually taking the sting out of that and meeting people in that equal level so that you're not scared to ask a question, but you're not making someone feel small as a result. 
you're actually empowering them to be able to answer the question with the right information and the consistency. Yes, yes, that's right, actually, yeah, yeah. That's what I love about what you do, you know, is that that real human element that you bring to communication. Hmm. Thanks very much. Well, it's a job I love, you know. And, and uh, Never. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd never guess it, would you, in a million years? Three proudest moments all centred around communication. Yeah. The boys are kind of like, yeah, they're a given. We love oh, the boys. Right. They're all right. <laughs> <laughs> they're more than all right. They're absolutely brilliant, all three of them. Yeah, they are. They're, they're wonderful boys. They've they done really a brilliant are, job I, I there. I just love the fact that you know they still want to go on holiday with us yes they'll come home it's not just because they get a free meal and maybe if they're lucky a bit of washing done but obviously in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but no they're, yeah, they're good company they're good boys and you did that well me and the yeah. of course well and yes, their you know. well we'll <laughs> no. let him have I, it i like to think that i had a fair bit of influence so obviously all the good things they get from me all the bad things they get from their dad that's just that's just obvious isn't it i'm telling him <laughs> don't listen (laughs) now then let's have a see then based on the fact that your three proudest moments are all centered around communication I'm wondering then what the secret of success might be according to Juliet I think you mentioned one of the things earlier on actually I think having a passion for what you do Mm. I know that seems really hackneyed doesn't it you know on CVs oh I'm passionate about this that and the other (laughs) (laughs) Um, it it has been a little bit overused but I think passion enthusiasm Mm. always learning you know never having a closed mind looking around me taking new ideas never thinking oh for instance oh I'm too old to be doing that that's something that really irritates me you know when social media came in I remember working with a PR agency and they thought that their USP was they had an 18 year old and he got social media and I thought why do you have to be 18 to yeah. get social media, you know? It's, it's crazy. And never losing delight in doing a oh. job well as well, you know. So that's really important. It's like we've just started off doing the podcast and that's something totally new for me. Yeah. And it's really exciting. So getting feedback from it is really exciting. And like even just putting out a press release and when it gets really well used, you know, I'm really delighted when that happens. Or when we do a social media post and it gets a good reaction or I see, you know, the teams using the answers that have suggested they use. So that for me, I think, is that's the secret to success and also to to a certain extent to being happy and satisfied in what you're doing. Well, I guess what I'm hearing there then, you know, we've got this kind of wrapper of passion and enthusiasm. But inside of that, it's about that recognition of the wins, recognition of what's going well, being able to celebrate those things. And, you know, it's almost like that look for the small things, isn't it? Look for the gratitude. It's that type of mindset that you're describing. So things will go wrong and, you know, you will be sent down rabbit holes and paths that you wouldn't choose to. But if you can keep sight of the things that go well, however small they are, and shake your pom-poms around them, (laughs) then that keeps you on track and keeps you feeling successful. Yeah, I think so. I do like the pom-poms. I do love a good pom-pom. I love a good pom-pom shake. Oh, yes, absolutely. They are the best, aren't they? And we don't do enough of it as humans, which is why the podcast is about Mm. shaking your pom-poms, because, you know, it allows you to lean in and celebrate your success. And you've been able to do that three Mm. times today. Yes, thank you very much, because it isn't actually something that you particularly think of very often, is it? Because no, we focus on what goes wrong and what we didn't do yeah. well and what we need yeah. to do better and what we need to do more of and what we haven't got. Yeah, or what we haven't done and yes. whether we're ever going to get it done. <laughs> the never-ending to-do list. <laughs> yes, you see, that I think is a secret of success. There's something I'm getting into is to not make a to-do list, which is unachievable. So, you know, you might write the to-do list and then just take some things off it because there's nothing worse than getting to the end of the week and think oh my god I didn't do it again so actually make your to-do list an achievable to-do list oh I love that and then you'll feel better at the end of the week yeah make your mountain one that you can actually climb yeah yep just be realistic (sighs) because I've been reading some stuff recently you know that it's very common especially in communications that people have massive workloads and Mm -hmm. they do set themselves too much to do and then 
it starts affecting their mental health, you know, because they're never getting to the bottom of it. And it's just such a simple thing, isn't it? You know, it's, everything's about prioritisation. Nobody is indispensable. You know, nobody expects everyone to absolutely, totally and utterly bust a gut and devote <laughs> 24 hours of every day to working. So just, yeah. Yeah, but know that if you did that, people will let you. So yeah, you've got to yeah, self-regulate true. that, haven't you? Mm. So that idea that you write your list and then you take stuff off mm. it. You mm. say no. You know, we, I, I might have said to you before, one of my favourite things is, yes, I can do that. And what do you want me to stop doing? Yeah. Because otherwise we just keep putting the yes, I can do that, add them to the to-do list and, you know, suddenly you're overwhelmed. It goes nuts. And it's better to do a few things well than yeah. loads and loads and loads of things, not particularly very well at all, I think. So the secret to success is that kind of prioritization and shaking your pom-poms and only putting things on the list that you know that it's realistic to achieve Mm. without putting barriers in your way. Yeah. And so that involves a certain amount of flexibility. Yes. And perseverance, doesn't it? But it's about knowing what's important to persevere with and what you need to be flexible about Ah, i love that she throws that one in at the end (laughs) (laughs) so juliet is all about passion is all about perseverance and public relations Um, (laughs) and a whole heap of other things that you've sprinkled on top so it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you for the woman that says that she wasn't prepared you've been able to come through with three brilliant pom-pom moments. So thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Well, of course, you've done your job and drawn it all out of me, haven't you? (laughs) Well, you know, this is what I do sitting here. I don't have to do any hard work, really. You just kind of come through and I ask the odd question here and there. My life is easy. (laughs) You make it look easy. (laughs) It was a joy. We will catch up again soon, no doubt. And I wish you a lovely rest of the day, scrolling those things off your to-do list. (laughs) Cutting them off without doing them. (laughs) I do do some stuff, honestly. (laughs) All right, you take good care and I'll speak to you soon. Lovely. Thanks then. Thank you. you Bye. And so, just like that, we're at the end of the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed your time listening today. And a big thank you from me for taking the time. I'd really love it if you would be able to leave a review because it really does help us to get noticed. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe and then you never miss an episode. I wish you a lovely rest of the day, whatever it is that you're doing. And I hope that you stay safe and well.